Party of Wednesday, 28th of January. Could I just remind members to make sure members in the public to make sure their mobile phones are switched off, and uh, the note that this, uh, this, this meeting may be recorded and some subsequently made available to the public for listening purposes. Clark, could you confirm the said event and apologies, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, we have 16 members present today, so we are quoted. We have an apology from Councillor McCutcheon. Thank you. Andy, and uh, Councillor Dix on route, um, somewhere between here and Newton Stewart. We'll be here as soon as we can. Yeah. Apologies to Councillor Ogilvie as well. Councillor Diggle. Apologies from Mike Carruthers. Uh, Councillor McComb is delayed at a medical appointment. He may not actually make it at all. Have we got any declarations of interest? Peter? Um, declaration of interest on item 6 by virtue of I'm an objector. What else was there? David? Item 5, I know the applicant used to work with him, Chair. And I'll declare an interest in item four, as I know some of the family are the applicant. Alistair? Item five, I know the applicant. Could, could I ask to confirm the minutes of the previous meeting or agree any amendments? I could ask the clerk to outline the procedures to be followed. Oh, Councillor Maitland. Uh, my apologies, uh, Chairman. I realise that I should declare an interest in um, you're being given some information. You're not deciding something, but I should declare um, uh, a, an interest in the very last item, which is number 11. Um, I am related to the applicant. Thanks, Jane. Jillian. I'm related to the object. Thank, thank you, Chair. Yes, the Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn as detailed on the agenda. The case officer or other appointed officer will make a short presentation addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. The Chairman has been provided with a list of eligible representatives who have registered to speak at this meeting within the period specified in Council policy. No other persons will be allowed to speak. The Chairman will individually invite those who have registered in advance to speak to make, their rec to make their presentation, after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of members. The order of eligible parties being heard will be as follows. Third parties objecting to an application. Third parties supporting an application. Statutory consultees objecting to an application elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning Applications Committee and then applicants or their agents. Representers have been placed in alphabetical order and a copy of the public speaking list is available from the committee officer taking notes of our proceedings. Presentations will be strictly limited to three minutes per person except for national and major developments which by their very nature are more complex where the time limit will be five minutes. The chairman of the committee will ask you to come to a conclusion if you take too long. Representers are encouraged to use the time allocated to clarify any points they consider material and address the determining issues. Certain matters are normally material are not normally material planning considerations and will not be taken into account by the council when deciding on planning application. Representers should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report, as members will have already read this report. 
After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session and no members of the public may address the committee from the public gallery. The Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to determine the application. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. We go into item four and I'll vacate the chair. I've got an interest in Thank you, Chair. Given Councillor Martin, who is the Chair of the Planning Applications Committee, has declared an interest for this item, the Vice Chair, Councillor Dempster, will assume the role of Chair for this item. Thank you. Back to you then, Councillor Gorroy. Mm, I wasn't here at the last meeting, so presumably I don't take part in this one or the item five either, so is that right? Thank I'm you. about to ask Gillian to remind members who are able to take part or participate in deliberation of this uh, application. Can I also just ask, well, although can you see, but... <laughs> can I ask members, firstly, we received a, a, a set of minutes, or, or papers, sorry, without the Georgetown Quarry in, we then got a set of papers with the Georgetown Quarry in. Those members that are able to participate, have you all received a copy, or are you confident that you had enough information on the previous a a papers to allow you to continue to determine this application. If anybody is not, then just either wave to me or shout out, please, and I see Councillor Geddes wanting to, to come in. So once we've established that, before Gillian reads out the members that can participate, Councillor Geddes, you wanted to come in? Questions been answered, sir. It was, why do we, do we really have to sit in this stage and gloom? You know, can we not just put the lights on and sort of look at the slides, you know, in the full benefit, with the full benefit of the light? I would hope so, and I do apologise for the way we are having to conduct business today, but apparently we have a defect temporarily with the electronic system. So I will ask the staff if they wouldn't mind just ensuring that the lights are only dimmed when we need to see the overhead projections. Okay, Gillian, can you confirm which members are able to participate in this deliberation this item, please? Thank you. Yes, for item four and item five today, only those members who heard the original representation for each of the item, that is item four and item five, will be allowed to determine each application. Members who heard the original representation but did not attend the site visit are also allowed to determine the application. So for item four, the members that are allowed to determine the application are Councillor Dempster, Councillor Dryborough, Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Geddes, Councillor Groom, Councillor Hislop, Councillor Maitland, Councillor McCautry, Councillor McComb, Councillor McKee, Councillor Ogilvy, although he's not here, um, Councillor Dempster, Coun sorry, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Witz. Thank you. Thanks, Gillian. And with that, Reminder, we go to item four, erection of the detached two-storey dwelling house and installation of septic tank and soak away at Georgetown Village, former quarry Dumfries. The application type is full planning permission. The recommendation is to refuse and the case officer is Lindsay Cameron. What I will do is ask Lindsay to go through the slides just to remind us uh, of the, the, the site for those of members that weren't present at the site visit and then we'll go into deliberation after that. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the location plan uh, for the application is on page nine of your papers, and I'll just run through the photographs. Okay, this is just the location plan for the application site. I'm showing the location of the former quarry um, in relation to Georgetown Village Small Building Group. Uh, the first photograph has been taken from Georgetown Road, approaching the application site from Dumfries to the north. Uh, the former quarry and the application site are located in the woodland to the rear of the existing houses which front Georgetown Road. Vehicular access uh, to the site is to the right-hand side of the road, um, where the front end of the silver car can be seen just beyond the, the middle of centre. <coughs> Moving south along Georgetown Road, this photograph shows vehicular access to the site. The site itself is located in the woodland to the rear of Dreams and Kelnor, which are the two dwellings located just beyond the access in the silver car. 
Looking west from Georgetown Road towards the site access and the application site beyond, the ground level within the application site is indicated by the dotted yellow line and um, is approximately six to seven metres above the, the level of Georgetown Road itself. Um, Travelling along Georgetown Road beyond the site access, this photograph looks northwest towards the application site. Um, and again, the, the ground level within the application site um, is indicated by the dotted yellow line. Moving into the application site, um, this is a view in a southerly direction. The vehicular access can be seen to the left hand side of the photo, uh, with a generally flat area beyond the trees where the blue container is sited, being the site for the proposed dwelling house and parking area. Continuing further into the site, this is a view looking east across the application site and back towards Georgetown Village. It's proposed that the dwelling would be positioned facing north in the centre of the flat area in the middle of the photograph. Looking north across the application site, the site of the dwelling is to the right of the centre of the photograph and um, with the access from Georgetown Road wrapping round from the left. Um, Telegraph pole towards the right hand side of the photograph um, shows the eastern edge of the application site. Moving over to the eastern edge of the site, this photograph looks back over the application site. Moving towards the north eastern corner of the site, this is a view to the east. Um, the existing dwellings in Georgetown Village can be seen through the trees and site access is at lower level to the left hand side of the photograph. This final photograph is taken from the eastern edge of the application site and looks down over Dreams in Kelnor which front onto Georgetown Road. Uh, this is an aerial view of the former quarry and the application site in relation to Georgetown Village. And the, the aerial view shows the extent of tree cover within the former quarry. Moving on to the plans, this is the proposed site plan shows the proposed location for the dwelling house and parking area, septic tank and Sokoe. The dwelling is positioned to face north. Um, this, this plan doesn't show Dreams and Kel North, the, the two existing dwellings which front on to Georgetown Road. And they would be beyond the red line of the application site towards the right hand side of the slide. And this slide shows the elevations for the dwelling house and finally the proposed floor plans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Can we have the lights again, please? Thanks very much. Okay, again, apologies for the quality of the reproduction. Everybody happy that that, that, that was adequate as far as reminder goes. Does anyone have any other questions then for Lindsay in terms of clarification before we go into session? Okay, in that case, members, we are in session. Councillor Geddes. I would suggest, sir, uh, notwithstanding the terms of the case officer's report, in fact, that this application be granted, and I've essentially got three reasons for saying that. Uh, if you wish, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you them now, or if you want uh, to leave it until later on in the, uh, the consideration of discussion, I'm in your hands, Chair. Provided that doesn't stimulate or, or, or prevent debate, I'm sorry, instead of stimulate, prevent debate, I'm happy to accept your proposal now, and then members can either support that or, or, or offer an alternative proposal. So, hey, hey, you're, oh, I'm, I'm grateful you to you, Chair. Well, well, firstly, I, 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 would, I would take the view, sir, that the, the, this proposed uh, application is, in fact, in keeping with uh, LDP Policy 3, it's within and well related to the existing small building group of Georgetown Village. Uh, it's also well related, I would suggest, to uh, creating a sense of place. Uh, and I don't think any of us would uh, dispute the fact that uh, it's also a beneficial redevelopment chair of a potentially dangerous and untidy brownfield site, uh, which is located right at the, in, in the centre of the village. That's the first ground, sir. Second ground, I would submit that uh, Proposals also in keeping with uh, OP1, uh, policy OP1, as the development of a house at this location, in my view, is in fact compatible with the character and amenity of the, the area and won't conflict with nearby uh, land uses. In fact, and my submission would be, Chair, that, that it will be exactly the same uh, land use as the adjoining properties, i.e. Uh, of a house. 
And lastly, uh, sir, uh, again, uh, I would suggest that the uh, proposal is in accordance with uh, uh, LDP policy OP2 and that it relates well to the scale, density and massing, the character and the appearance and the use of materials of the surrounding properties. And in doing so, Chair, it will be sympathetic to the existing local built forms and will also respect the physical features of the site and of the village vicinity. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Geddes. I'm sure if we get to a, a vote and we require to document that, we'll maybe get that written form from you, either that or we'll ask David to condense it somehow and, and, and get it still be acceptable. I've got uh, Councillor Hislop, uh, Councillor McCaughtry, Councillor Dreibler and Councillor Grimm. Chair, I'm similarly minded to Councillor Geddes' view. However, there's one question, I don't know if it's something we can look at. The actual render on the house, now, maybe it's because I come from the other side of the valley. In my ward, looking across, it would actually, a white house there may stick out more than one with a sort of, I think the two houses below were is it kind of champagne colour and they seem to blend in better to the background. That's my only concern that looking from a distance across towards the Craig's area, you'd actually have a house that was standing out, but I don't know if that's something that we could look at or whether it would find support condition to uh, maybe look at a different colour for the render. If we get to the stage that we're in agreement to support this proposal, I'm sure we could place a condition of, of a render, provided the, the proposer is happy to endorse that. Uh, Councillor McCaughtry? So I want the councillor has one, but I won't repeat. Thank you. Councillor Drybra? <coughs> Thank you, and I totally agree with what Councillor Geras actually says, and if he was to put that forward as, as, a, as a motion, I would certainly second that, and obviously there would be a c conditions agreed by the, the officers and, and, and the applicant as well. But everything else has been said that I was going to say. Thanks for that, Councillor Grimm. Well, I was going to be quite happy to second Councillor Geddes. And uh, as far as the colour goes, over 30 years ago, and I had lived in Georgetown for over 30 years, there was a house built on the top of the hill by Graham McGeorge, which overlooked the whole place, and it was white. And it fitted in, so I don't see why this would be any different. If we come to that, I'm sure we can leave it to officers to, to agree at an acceptable colour tone. Uh, Councillor Maitland? Um, well, members won't be entirely surprised to hear that I rather disagree. Um, I, I do understand why members feel that it's probably OK at the moment. It's because it's very, very much a tree-covered area. Um, and I think if you imagine those trees removed um, and you uh, look particularly from the Dumfries end, I think you'll find that the building will actually um, do as the officer has suggested, which will have a material adverse effect upon the in, in the landscape. I think that's, uh, that's actually the case, um, although I understand why it's not so obvious at the moment. Indeed, Councillor Hislop's point that it is a very visible site, it will be very visible, particularly if there's something above it. Um, actually uh, lends some level of um, substance to what I'm saying as well. Um, so uh, I would agree the recommendation. I would move the recommendation amendment to the recommendation. Thanks for that, Councillor Mayton. Do you have a, a seconder for that particular proposal? In that case, that proposal falls. Do you want dissent recorded? If you don't, that's great. Okay, can you ensure that happens, Gillian? And then do you also then, or would members like to consider placing a condition on tree cover or, or foliage, etc. And I'll defer to Councillor Geddes about placing a condition such as that on the on the approval. Councillor McKee. Actually, Chair, you've just hit on the subject I was going to raise. Is there's nothing, I can't remember anything being in here regarding tree cover or removal of trees. And I think it would be sensible Somebody's mentioned a two, two metre high fence uh, at the front of it. I think uh, uh, a tree cover or hedge would be more appropriate than a big uh, boarded fence. I just wonder what the, the planners would have to say about that. I, I accept, uh, in Councillor Hislop's issue on being seen for a distance, the tree cover would help to alleviate that, I would have thought. But just uh, if we find out just exactly what the, would be proposed, please. 
Okay, I'll ask David just to give some advice on that because clearly the, we wouldn't want to place a tree preservation order on the whole a, a, a area. That would be unreasonable. But if we could find some mechanism that would satisfy members that would ensure there's a level of uh, foliage there and also uh, defer to officers to agree a, a colour scheme that is appropriate for the area. David, can you just respond to that maybe, please? Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. I would probably agree that given that they are the trees which we saw on site in uh, not the best of conditions, it, they are self-seeding. And I don't think there's any doubt that they've grown up over the last 100 years or so since I think the, the quarry was abandoned. In themselves, they're probably not worthy of a tree preservation order for the whole site. But there is still a, an inherent value to the, the landscape setting of the area. So you can attach conditions requiring that no trees be felled without the prior approval of the planning authority, which I think would be appropriate in as far as it would have to, it would only cover the trees within the application site, but it would at least allow the planning authority to ensure that there was a level of tree cover still retained across the site. In terms of the colour of the render, equally that can be conditioned and agreed. The, the only thing which I would add in, um, listening to Council Geddes' uh, grounds for supporting it. Obviously, it's, it's the age-old thing that, as officers, we have looked at this and we've given consistent advice in the past. We have considered this to be contrary to the policy of the Local Development Plan. I think, provided it was worded slightly differently, there was enough there to, to justify making an exception to the plan um, so that you would be putting forward that, for example, the issue about it would be a, a, a beneficial redevelopment of the quarry. I mean, acknowledging the quarry has actually been redundant for about 100 years now and it's regenerated. But um, I think if you could argue that you felt that it did relate to the, the grouping of Georgetown in a, a not unacceptable manner that allowed it to be approved as an exception to policy, that uh, there was the the redevelopment of the, the former quarry site and it would not result in um, undue loss of amenity to the, the neighbouring properties. I think if you phrased it in those ways, then that, that's a very competent ground. Thanks for that, David. Councillor Geddes, are you happy to have that paraphrase in such a way? I, I have no problems whatsoever with that, Chair, and uh, I'm grateful to Mr. Mr. Sutty for his, uh, his professional uh, advice. Uh, I would also suggest, Chair, that... Uh, other standard conditions such as planting etc would, would be would be deemed and and, and wall, wall colouring etc would be deemed to apply to to, to the, the grant thanks for that and thanks for your assistance councillor Geddes in that case are members uh, minded to agree the application with those conditions attached Gillian can you just inform the members of the decision please Thank you, Councillor Dempster. Um, yes, the application has been um, approved um, on the grounds um, it would be beneficial. It would be a beneficial redevelopment of the quarry, and it would not result in the undue loss of amenity. And it did relate to the the, the grouping of uh, the area. Um, the appropriate um, planning conditions covering um, the tree felling and the colour of the render. Um, would be attached to the um, application being granted as a condition. Um, Councillor Maitland has um, once heard dissent recorded to this decision. Yes, the condition would include planting where appropriate. Thanks very much, Gillian. Thanks, Lindsay. Jillian, could you think members are available to take part in this debate? Thank you, Chair. Yes, for this item, um, the members who can determine the application are Councillor Martin, Councillor Dempster, Councillor Crothers, although he's not present, Councillor Drybra, 
Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Geddes, Councillor Groom, Councillor Hislop, Councillor Maitland, Councillor McCautry, Councillor McComb, although he is not present, Councillor Ogilvy, although he is not present also, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Witts. Thank you. Thanks, Gillian. Alistair. Thanks, Chair. Uh, before we proceed, I would like governance advice on a certain issue. Um, uh, and under item two, I declared an interest in that I, I know the applicant. I made a similar declaration uh, at the meeting of the 16th of December, and this is a continuation uh, which deferred from that time. But the difference is that in, on the 16th of December, I also can, I, I elaborated and I said that although I knew the applicant, I considered that my interest was such that I did not feel it necessary for me to uh, absent myself from the meeting, and I did take part in that debate. Uh, it was probably um, um, clumsy of me, but I should perhaps have elaborated in a similar way at the beginning of this meeting, because in the interest of consistency, I still hold to the, the same view that uh, my interest is such that I do not feel I need to absent myself. However, I failed to do that, as you know, and I wondered what governance advice was on that. Gillian. Thank you, Councillor Witts. Yes, um, this application uh, was first considered on the 16th of December, where you did declare an interest. However, you felt that there was no requirement for yourself to leave and would remain in the meeting to determine the application. Given that it's a continuation, that would um, still continue. However, it is ultimately a matter for yourself if you feel circumstances have changed. But given what you've said, I don't think you do, so the position would remain. Right. Uh, item 5 is the erection of dwelling house, installation of septic tank and soak away and formation of access at Plot 2, Lillibank, Glen Howen, Dumfries. Reference number 14-B-3-0525. We're continuing in uh, members in session late, but I'll ask Lindsay to run through the slides for members' benefit. Thank you, Chair. The location plan for this application is on page 17 of your paper. <coughs> this first slide shows the location of the application site in relation to the Glen Howen Small Building Group. Um, um, the, the yellow dots um, on this slide show the existing dwellings um, in Glenhound, which are all arranged around the access in Glenhound Farm. Um, the, the site or the area outlined in blue shows the site for which planning permission in principle was granted for Dwelling House in March 2014. This photograph has been taken from the public road to the southeast of Glen Howen. The extent of the small building group is indicated in yellow, with the application site located to the southwest of the existing group. Moving along the public road to the access to Glen Howen, this photograph looks in a westerly direction towards the application site, which lies beyond the hedge to the left of centre. A Lilybank Cottage can be seen to the right. Again taken from the public road, this photo looks along the northeastern boundary of the <coughs> application site. The application site extends to the southwest as far as the trees on the left hand edge of the photo. <coughs> Panning west, this photo looks across the application site which extends the hedge and trees towards the left hand edge of the photo. And this is probably a better view of the application site looking in a westerly direction. From the centre of the southeastern edge of the site, this is a view looking north across the application site. The southwest boundary is marked by the hedge to the left of the photo, and the north, east, and south boundaries uh, by post and wire fences. Panning west, this is a view of the southwestern part of the site, showing the existing boundary treatment. Panning east, this photo looks back across the application site towards Lilia Bank Cottage. And from towards the southwestern end of the application site, this photograph looks back towards Glen Howen, the access to which is where the silver cars parked to the right hand side of the photograph. We begin to Glen Howen. This final photograph looks north towards Dovecotwell Cottages and Glen Howen. Um, the existing houses are arranged around the access to uh, Glen Howen Farm. 
And this final slide uh, shows an indicative site plan for the proposed development. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Members, we're now in session. Archie. Thanks, yeah. <clears throat> I think it was really, really useful to go on this, this um, site visit, uh, along with other members. Uh, pity about the weather that day was the only thing I would, I would actually say. Um, I, I'm, I'm of a mind to actually grant this, because it's planning permission in principle, I, I believe that it does fall within the small buildings group that, 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 was, that was discussed at the last application. And um, because it's planning permission in principle, I, 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 would, I would suggest that a full planning application would come after this because obviously there have to be agreement um, from, from officers to, to, to bring it here. There's no actual any uh, objections to this particular application and, and that's the reason why I'm suggesting that we can actually recommend the planning permission in principle. Um, so, and I'd leave it at that to hear what the members say. Done. Happy to support uh, what Councillor Dreiber is saying. Uh, I think I was personally asked for the site visit, and that, that's the reason why I asked for the site visit, that when you look at what was displayed on the screen there, and you actually see it on the ground, you get a far better perspective. And I think, as Archie says, it fits in very well with the, what previously called the small buildings group. So I see no ob objection to uh, granting in principle. Jack? I fully concur with the sentiment said so far. It does fit in with that group. Any other members? Jane? Um, I, I don't disagree with other members. Um, I do think, though, that the critical thing will be where this next um, house is sited. And, um, and, and that will be the, the, the factor, I, I suspect, um, I agree with Councillor Dreiber that this is a, only in principle, so we don't know where the building is going to be sited within the plot. But it seems to me that um, uh, officers have simply taken a, a, a decision that the whole plot does not relate to this bu building group. And that's the bit that I find quite difficult to understand because I think it's perfectly possible to put a, a building, place a building, to create a sense of place and a grouping. Um, in that plot. So I, I'm prepared to go against recommendation on this one because I think it's, it's possible to achieve what would be correct within our policies. I have to say, simply because somebody hasn't objected doesn't seem to me a good reason for uh, agreeing an application. <laughs> got any other members? We've got the motion from Councillor McCockery that we go, with it, we go against the, the recommendation. Um, yeah, just to try and summarise what's being said, our, was it, it Councillor Dreiber who actually put forward the motion? Yeah. Um, is that on the, the basis that the, the house would be in the position that was shown in the indicative plan? Because, um, as you can see from, sorry, from that slide there, that is on the indicative, but it does indicate that the house would be located immediately adjacent to the other house. Um, I mean, if because it is a planning permission principle, that plan actually has no status unless you actually have conditions tying it to that, because you could, in theory, get um, you know the the house could easily sit all all over here, which really wouldn't sit so well with the the grouping at all. So if you were minded to approve it, then I would suggest that probably you, bearing in mind what you've said, is to have a condition saying that um, you know that any house shall be sited within the uh, presumably that's the northeast uh, corner of the application site to relate to the the grouping. Yeah, th 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 thanks to Mr. Sutty for his, for his advice, and I would take that advice uh, forward and, and say that uh, the plan in principle would be because looking at the indicative plan in that particular area. Of course, we have to make sure, of course, that a full plan and application comes forward, and there may be issues such as where the septic tank is and all that type of thing. Uh, so I would agree with that. Members agree? Gillian. 
Thank you, Chair. Yes, the um, decision has been made to approve the application subject to the appropriate standard, um, planning conditions and a condition that any house um, to be cited would be in the North East. Thank you. Thank you. Gillian, can you say something about item 8? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I apologise for not having said this at the beginning of the meeting, um, but item 8 has in fact been withdrawn from the agenda today. Therefore, if anybody um, in the public gallery is here in relation to item 8, it will not be heard and you should leave now. I apologise for not having stated this at the beginning of the meeting today. Thank you. Item 8 is the application um, for the erection of 8 dwelling houses and 12 flatted dwellings by Dumfries and Galloway Housing Partnership at Lockfield Road, Dumfries. Thank you. No, you got the second agenda, Tom, it's item 8. <coughs> Members. Members, we'll go into the item six. It's the erection of four port rebreeding units, storage building, biomass boiler building, incinerator building, the temporary siting of the manager's mobile accommodation unit, and the installation of a septic tank and soap away, and formation of surface water the detention pond and access road and car pattern at land to the northwest of Black Rig Farm, Loch Mabin. The reference number of the application is 14-P-4-0414. And speaking, we'll ask uh, Dean. Dean has got to show us the slides on this. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, just just referring to page 25 on the agenda, uh, just to show, explain the site context. Uh, you'll see the site indicated there in the middle of the, the page. It's 1.1 kilometres west of Loch Maven. Uh, it's located in a, in a rolling agricultural landscape. Uh, the proposal is four rectangular poultry sheds aligned parallel and linked. And I'll, I'll just take you through the actual plans yeah. just now. As I say, it's four linked. Uh, rectangular sheds, 96 metres long uh, by 16.5 metres wide, 5.2 metres in height, uh, arranged with a link building running across the, the gable so it links each of the four units without having to come outside. Uh, this is also a general storage building proposal that you'll see uh, middle on the right side there and also a biomass boiler building and an incinerator building. <coughs> Also associated with the proposal is uh, a surface water detention pond and hard, <coughs> hard surface areas for manoeuvring and parking around the site. You'll see middle bottom there. This is the landscaping proposal for the site. The top image or top two images show the cut through the existing uh, levels to, to lower the site. Uh, and create a bond that you'll see on the plan view down the right hand side there which is the uh, boundary to the minor road that you'll see on later images. Uh, access there through an existing field gate and then you've, what you've got is a bond that will be formed along the right hand edge to the, to the minor road uh, that will be created from the excavated soils uh, in level in the site. Uh, there's a retained hedgerow Along the bottom of the image, that you'll, I'll pick out on other, other photographs of the site, and uh, reinforced landscaping planting along the north there uh, and the, the west. That's just the detail of the access. Uh, oh, you'll, you'll understand that later in the images. It's an improved access off an existing field gate. And that's a caravan that's proposed for three years uh, to support the management of the site and that will be sited just adjacent to the, the access into the site. That's a, a, a if you like a, an imposed, uh, the, the development imposed on a real life view of the site. 
you can see the, the, the landscape and the bonding around the edges of the building. And this is taken from the submission uh, to demonstrate how the, the buildings would sit within the site. This is an existing image coming south along this minor road towards the site. And this is an existing uh, field boundary with the trees and the, the maturing hedgerows. And this is the same, same view with the uh, montage, the, the view with the bond you can see along the, the boundary with the minor road. And then you can see through the gaps the, the, exit, the proposed uh, development. Now, these are my photographs um, from the site visit. This is from a, a slightly elevated position to the south of the site on the same field, uh, but this will fall outside of the application site where I'm actually stood here. It's just looking generally towards what lo may be off right. And we've got the tree there on the left that will be close to the, the boundary of the site. That will be retained. <coughs> oh, that's panning left from that view. You've got the, the tree there again on the right hand side. This is looking across the core of the, the development. You see the cows in the, towards the, the, the bottom of the yellow arrow there. This is, that's the field boundary following the minor road. And the core of the development will be sat in that lower, lower portion of the, of the same field towards the, the boundary, the, the hedgerow boundary you can see. And I pointed out Burnbray because that's the nearest property to the site. Uh, that's about around 150 meters from the, from the site. Uh, that's positioned along the, the side of the A709. And that's panning left from the previous, just showing the, the existing hedgerow to the minor road. And you can possibly just make out a, a field gate there towards the left of the hedgerow. Uh, that will be where the, the improved access into the site will be formed. Yep. So this is coming down to that same boundary now. There's the, the existing field access looking along uh, the, the hedgerow towards the A709. And this is, I've come, you know, I'm obviously at the, the field boundary now. This is looking along where the proposed bond would be formed along this, this boundary towards the, the hedgerow there in the distance. From the same position panning right back across into the site and across the site this will be a lot of this on in the left middle will be part of the excavated grounds to lower the site that's panning right from the the previous and that's along the minor road looking towards the a709 the bond there will be just on the other side of the hedgerow And this is back to the other end of the site along the same road looking south. The, you can just about make out a field gate there just to walk on the, in the hedgerow on the left. That will be where there's potential for a, a new passing place along this minor road. And that's panning left from the same position showing the, the existing uh, hedgerow field boundary that will be retained as part of the proposals. This is towards the site from the A709. We're in an elevated position here to the uh, southwest of the site. Looking towards it, it'll be behind, generally be behind the tree in the distance. The, I say the tree, the tree behind the, the telegraph pole there in the sort of middle of the, the image. And this is from a, a position just for, to the north east of the site. Just, I'm just to, I've stepped off the A709 here. You can see the A709 formed in the hedgerows there on the, on the right-hand side. Looking towards the site again, there's, that's the hedgerow that will be retained. The site will be behind that hedgerow from this position. That's a closer image of Burnbray, the nearest property along the A709. The, the principal elevation of that site looks to the left uh, towards the site. That's the other minor road closest to the site that runs along uh, not by the site this isn't the boundary site but it's a boundary to the same field uh, that won't but this part of the field on the on the right will not be in the application site this is a minor road in the proximity of the site 
and these images are included uh, to give you a, a, a sort of real life impression of something very similar. This is an application that was uh, considered and approved by Planning Applications Committee for the same or very similar unit operated by the same applicant uh, near Carruthers Town. This is the kind of general form of the building that is proposed about the colour in, in, in the situation you're presently considering is juniper green and olive green rather than this grey colour. You see the silos there and the, the setting within this concrete apron. <laughs> That's the detention uh, pond that come, that's been developed with that application similar to the one proposed here. That's all the images. Uh, it's recommended for approval subject to 12 conditions. The conditions largely relating to access, road improvements, landscaping and retention of the hedgerow and uh, environmental conditions for the control of odour. Uh, nothing more to say on this matter at the moment. Members, point of clarification for Dean. Ian. Uh, just in 3.1, 3, 3 can I just ask the case officer uh, an item G of the representations. Uh, could you just comment on the, um, the uh, local plan general policy 55A, which relates to water supplies? Well, sorry, what, where was, could you just clarify that? There was um, 3.1 you were saying in the representations. Yeah, 3.1G 3, 3 um, uh, in the list of the, the summary of representations it says that the proposal may have impacts upon private water supplies in the area potentially conflicting with requirements of um, LPG policy 55A. Uh, So yeah, is this Councillor Dick's working off the papers oh. that are missing the um, item four that was added item. on later? So we're at possibly item five that we're on. So just now you're using your paper. updated papers. My apologies. You got that, Ian? Andy? No, my apologies, I've got the older papers. Councillor Maitland? Um, it was just uh, SEPA's response um, on 2.6b, page 33. Just wonder if I could ask about this tank business. We seem to be wanting a bigger tank, but I, I mean, there's no issue there, is there? Dean? Yeah, I've, uh, this was a, a requirement of SEPA. I've, that's been put to the applicant and they've, they've actually responded to say that they're happy to install the appropriately sized tank in accordance with the SEPA's requirements. And it doesn't impact physically upon our, our um, deliberations? It's a buried tank. It's buried, thank yeah. you. Councillor McKee? It's just a similar sort of question. It's actually it's to do with the distribution of that 45,000 litres of water. What control, if any, do you consider necessary to ensure that that's not going to land into water courses and what have you? Dean? I think I'm correct in saying that would be subject to CP licensing. Not, not for control for, by the planning authority. There are other licensing regimes that the applicant would have to go through with other uh, licensing authorities. So CEPA would have to be uh, approached by the applicant for that, for those technical matters. Thanks, Chair. 
Any other members? Thank you. It's a question for Dean. It's on 1.10.2. It says here that the, the scale is not uh, dissimilar and that uh, like Hunter House Farm, what's the, the area of uh, Hunter's House Farm? Uh, that's a comment from the applicant. It's, yeah. it's not uh, it's not a quote from our assessment. I've I've pulled that as a, a matter that's been highlighted by the applicant. So possibly best to direct that to the applicant because I haven't I haven't tested that. Yeah. yeah. Just to say that it's actually five times the size of that. Any other members? Right. Thanks, Dean. No. Right, we've got the objectors now uh, speaking. Der Derek Mills speaking as an objector. Right, Derek, if you take a seat there. You've got, five, you've got five minutes, Derek, and I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. I've never done this before, I'm very nervous. But my objection is, after visiting the site, you call Crows there, just outside Dalton, there's a, there's enormous sheds there. There's not a window in them. So all the poultry kept in these uh, sheds have no access to natural daylight. There's no axes or doors so these birds can go outside and breathe fresh air or anything. If this is not factory farming, I don't know what is. My uh, third object, uh, second objection is, why on a greenfield site when there's dozens of sites where a, uh, this could be cited elsewhere. That's if the committee go along with this planning application. That? Yeah, that's what I want to say. I don't think the way that say factory farming is a planning application. Well, you might say it's a, a factory farm. It might be get all the numbers from the EU under planning applications. But you can say what happened in Balson and uh, somewhere like Auschwitz. They had gas chambers, worked work very well, but they weren't certainly not right, were they? Right. You've got your questions, members? No. Any questions, Phil? No. Derek? No. no. Right. Right. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. Go, you're the same. You've got five minutes, and I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the objections voiced by 148 locals to the proposed poultry development near Lot Maben. My points will be concluded by Tony Hancock of the Lot Maben Community Council, who will speak later today. Our main concern is the unacceptable impact upon the landscape and visual amenity and on the character of our area. The applicants commissioned a landscape and visual assessment report in July 2014 from Patterson Landscape. I have a copy here. Much of this report has been adopted by council officers, and many of its findings are included in the papers in front of you. In section 2.4 of the council report, it states that the council architect has, quote, no objections. In his report that's available online, he states that he has not actually visited the site. Requests from one of our local councillors and the Lot Maben Community Council for the council landscape architect to visit the site have been turned down. The officer involved says, quote, as stated before, this is an operational matter for officers to consider, and for the reasons stated, a site visit by the landscape architect was not considered necessary in this instance, unquote. Thus, many of the views within the council report are derived from the applicant's report rather than a site visit. We disagree with much that has been presented in this report. On page two, it states, quote, the proposed use as a poultry breeding facility is not wholly different to the existing use of the land, unquote. The existing use of the land is for grazing cattle and sheep and also for the production of silage. This has been adopted by the council report in section 1.10.2, virtually word for word. How can the landscape architect understand the land without actually visiting the site and the use of it? Also on page two, it states, quote, the scale of the proposed development is similar to that of some of the nearby farms e.g. Hunter House and Burnside, unquote. The facts are, the proposed development is 6,895 square metres of buildings. Hunter House has approximately 1,320 square metres of buildings, 
and Burnside has approximately 2,917 square meters of buildings. The proposed development, as mentioned before, is over five times the size of Hunter House Farm and 2.4 times the size of Burnside. The relative sizes of the buildings can be clearly seen on the location map. Both the council report and the applicant's report are factually incorrect on some issues and appear to be misleading. How can we allow applicants to submit landscape reports that are not entirely true and then adopted by the council as a true record without a site inspection from the council landscape architect? I'm also worried by Mr. Souter's comment in an email to Mr. Hancock of Lock Maben Community Council where he states, quote, however, he, referring to the council landscape architect, was unable to undertake a proper assessment of the proposal through a combination, uh, was, was able to undertake a proper assessment of the proposal through a combination of experience, existing local knowledge of the site, and by studying the detailed assessment submitted by the applicant in the form of the landscape and visual assessment, end quote. The report also states, quote, there will be no skyline effect due to the relatively low elevation of the proposed site, end quote. This is again untrue. There'll be a large expanse of buildings, along with four seven-meter-high feed bins, and also all the photos that you've looked at today were taken in the summer. If you were to visit the site today, you'd see a very different picture. Later in the report, it states, quote, the proposed change in land use is not significant, end quote. I'm sorry, but it certainly is significant, and that's why there have been so many objectors. Also stated in the report, quote, the proposed development would utilize the lowest portion of the existing field, end quote. This is not true. If you visited the site, you'd see the lowest part of the field is at the east end of the field. The proposed development is at the west end of the field, which is in fact the highest end. The report also mis misrepresents the distances from the three nearest houses from the application site. It states that Burnbrae is 100 meters away, Burnbank 400 meters, and Blackrig 300 meters, when in fact they are respectively 109 meters 220 metres, 123 metres. It fails also to include Gowan Lee, which you could see clearly on the photos, which is seconds, Nicole. situated to the north of the site um, and is 137 metres away. The proposed site is owned by a local farmer. He has alternative places, the other side of the A709. I wonder why the, it hasn't been decided to site those poultry units there. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Members, Archie. Thanks for your presentation, Nicole, um, and, and, and listening to what you were actually saying there. Do you think it would be beneficial for this committee to actually visit the site and see for themselves um, the, 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 you know, the, the suggestions that you're making? I think it would be highly beneficial. I think you get a very different picture. Jack? I just to ask Nicole to, to finish off by saying alternative. Could you expand on the alternative land? Um, my understanding is that in, there was a site meeting, in, which I didn't attend myself because we were away, but in February uh, 2014, in which Mr. Barker indicated that the farmer, Mr. Kincaid, had offered him uh, potentially an alternative site, the other side of the A709. However, he was favoring this current site because it had better connections to electricity, and that is obviously because of the proximity of the dwellings. Any other members? Right, thanks, Nicole. Thank you. We have uh, Donald Wallace, please. You again, Donald. You've got five minutes, and I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. Um, because of the landscape worries about the application, Objectors arranged to have a professional landscape architect look at it. The person who did this is a chartered fellow of the Landscape Institute and a director of a landscape architecture and environmental planning practice. Unfortunately, he can't be here today, but this I am about to read is his report, slightly shortened because of the time constraint. The report reads, it is clear that the main considerations in landscape and visual terms are the physical scale and siting of the building and its associated impact upon the adjacent RSA, the Regional Scenic Area. My observations are, one, that the main component of the application is four poultry units situated close to each other, forming an overall building footprint of 8,500 square metres with surrounding infrastructure and roads that amounts to almost a hectare in footprint. 
This is a very substantial building footprint in a rural area, the largest within a very significant area and larger than any single building within Loch Maven. While comparisons are drawn in the Council's assessment to other nearby farm building groups, some of which are undoubtedly large, none matches in terms of the sheer physical mass of the proposed buildings. Secondly, that the site of a development of this scale becomes an important planning consideration as it has the potential to adversely change the landscape character and visual amenity of its surroundings. The planning application proposed by the applicant is reasonable from a for a development of this type, but this would not mean that a development such as this can or should be allocated anywhere in the countryside. Mitigation of this type should be a secondary consideration. Good siting in the first place is the most important. I do not consider that the excuse <coughs> me. I do not consider that the site chosen for this development is optimal for the reasons set out below. Firstly, the proposed development has been sited in an open field which is close to and conspicuous from the A seven oh nine road on, on its approach to Loch Megan from Dumfries. While the mitigation would over time serve a break up serve to break up the appearance of the development. I am in no doubt that for a very considerable period of time, this enormous building group would be a very conspicuous feature in the landscape. Secondly, that the road provides an important impression of the landscape setting of Loch Maben, not least because it travels through the RSA designation that covers the ridge line and descends toward Loch Maben, giving an elevated impression of Loch Maben's setting in a rural context. The descent from near Hunter House Farm will feature the proposed development directly in the line of sight, significantly compromising this special quality. And finally, that the planning officer refers to LDP policy NE2, <coughs> excuse me, relating to RSAs in his report to the committee, but he does not, in my view, attribute sufficient weight to a key consideration of that policy. While the applicant's site lies immediately out with the boundary of the RSA, the policy makes provision for the effect that it might have upon it. The report to committee makes no reference to the second component of the test of policy, which in my view is a relevant point that should have been considered, namely whether, quote, there is a specific need for the development in that location which could not be located in a less sensitive area, end quote. Clearly, there is no specific need for this development to be located on this particular site. And in my opinion, a less sensitive location should be found elsewhere where the special scenic qualities of the RSA designation would not be compromised. That's his report. Hold. Members? Any members? Could have Tony Hancock on behalf of Loch Maven, uh, Loch Maven and District Community Council, please. <clears throat> You're the same, Donald. You've got five minutes, and I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. Good morning. Tony Hancock, Vice Chair of Loch Maven Community Council. Although the applicant will have you believe that there are no issues with odour and flies, we all know that hen smell, hens also attract flies, and with 39,500 of them, we will have, um, and will have an effect, especially when the sheds are being mucked out during the summer. In addition, there is also an incinerator for burning dead stock. We all know that hens attract vermin. The applicant will have you believe that this is not an issue, and this may well be the situation for the first few years of operation. But as the sheds age and more and more holes appear in the, in the fabric, the buildings will become, the vermin will become a problem. People be reminded that the closest house is only 109 meters away. There will also be issues, although the vent, there will also be noise issues. Though the ventilation fans may be quiet, what about the noise from the wagon, tractors, loaders, especially when they are making that deep, deep, deep sound when they are reversing? Imagine trying to sit out in your garden on a Sunday, Sunday afternoon listening to the sheds being mucked out. The access from the A709 to the minor road is a serious concern to locals. This is a dangerous piece of road, especially when coming from Dumfries' direction and turning right. The access to the other piece of land on the north side of the A709 has been offered to the applicant, 
and would be much more suitable. There is much made in the report that compares this proposal with the site the applicant operates near Dalton. The comparisons are not valid as the, the, the two closest houses to the Dalton site are half a mile away and there are only 16 rural properties within a mile. With the Loch Maven proposal, there are 19 houses within half a mile, three within 137 metres, and 62 within a mile. The Dalton site is also on some low ground and is screened to be screened by established natural vegetation. The Loch Maven site will stick out like a sore thumb. When the proposal of application notice was submitted in January 2014, it stated that the location was land adjacent to the A709, Loch Maven to Lockerbie, and that the development would be 5,040 square metres. In section 4.22 of the council report, it states that officers are satisfied that the, that the proposed application notice adequately described the development, and that the supporting information accurately indicated the location of the development. I find this uh, strange on three points. Point one, the location is not between Loch Bean and Loch Maven. It's on the other side of Loch Maven by about two kilometres. Point two, on the planning application, the area of the development is 6,818 square metres, a 35% increase from the proposal of application notice. And the proposal actual area, as detailed in the report, will be 7,502 square metres, including the pond. This is 50% larger than the proposal application notice. Point three, the actual application site is now roughly five or six times the area stated in the proposal application notice. In conclusion, I'm asking the committee to refuse this application for the following reasons. Number one, I'm questioning whether or not the correct planning procedure has taken place with respect to the proposal application notice correctly describing the proposed redevelopment and its location. Number two, the Patterson Landscape Report, which was commissioned by the applicant and was largely adopted by the planning officer, has many inaccuracies and should not be relied upon. Point three, the site is not included in the local development plan. Point four, the proposal de proposed development is contrary to council policies NE2, NE13, OP1 and OP2, and similarly to the Dalton Sorry, two. A lot of supporting information within the report compares this proposed site with its similarity to Dalton. Nothing could be further from the truth. The number of objectors is 148. 90% of the objectors have Loch Maven as their postal address. 100%, 19 out of 19 of households within half a mile of the development have objected, and 92%, 57 out of 62, 30 seconds of, to go, don't you? of real properties within a mile of the, the proposed have objected. The majority of these people have never objected to a planning application in their life, but they feel very strongly about this proposal. I should also point out that there are no letters of support. If you are not prepared to refuse the application today, I would ask you to conduct a site visit so that you can see the issues for yourselves firsthand before reaching a decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tony. Members? Thank you, Tony. Can we, can we have the agent applicant, Julie Diamond and John Bowker, please? You've got five minutes and I'll let you know if that's seconds to go. Thank you. Right. Thank you for the opportunity to address members of the Planning Application Committee. I will now present a statement in support of the proposal and I'm happy to answer any questions that members may have on the planning merits of the application afterwards. The planning officer has provided a full and comprehensive report which addresses the objections that have been raised and makes it clear that the proposal complies with the adopted local development plan. It is not my intention to repeat the officer's comments, but I would like to take the opportunity to highlight the key issues at the heart of the application. It is accepted that, as an agricultural business in a rural location, um, a, sorry, as an agricultural business, a rural location is required and is wholly appropriate for this operation. 
you as a local planning authority have approved other similar and identical proposals in locations similar to this at Rutherstown, Kirkpatrick Fleming and Eddingham, as highlighted in paragraph 1.17 of the officer's report. The policies and objectives of your adopted local development plan, in my opinion, support this proposal. Your planning officer agrees with this position. There have been a number of concerns raised by objectors. None of the issues raised have been found justifiable by the planning officer or by the relevant statutory experts to have scrutinized this application. It is accepted that a certain degree of landscape impact is inevitable. Good practice establishes how such impacts should be considered. The landscape architect commissioned by the applicant has concluded that the application poses no significant landscape impact. Your landscape officer agrees with this position and has offered no objections to the proposal. Traffic generation in relation to the proposal will be minimal, with an average vehicle movement of less than two lorries per week. The proposal will implement improvements to the road through both the widening of the junction at the A709 and the introduction of a passing plate. This will also improve the situation for those agricultural vehicles already using the road. The roads department advice is that the proposal is acceptable. Environmental standards confirm they have no objections in relation to odour, noise or vermin control. The environmental standards officer has visited the applicant's existing operation in Carruthers and was satisfied that the operation poses no threat to local environment or amenity. Surface and foul water drainage will be fully managed using a combination of a new sud system and a septic tank, which are also successfully used at the applicant's other facilities in the region. The operation will not increase the risk of flooding, either at the site or in the local area. Discussions with SEPA have taken place throughout the application process and they have confirmed that they have no objections to the proposal. As the planning officer's report confirms, Planning decisions must take account of all relevant adopted local policies. It is inevitable that some conflict may occur between specific policy topics. In such cases, policies which support proposal must be weighed against the policies which do not. In this case, it is evident that the number of strategic objectives and policies which favour the proposal significantly outweighs policies which do not. This is a high quality scheme that will boost the local rural, rural economy and therefore delivers the aspirations and objectives of the local development plan. A great deal of consideration and care has been taken to ensure the development can be assimilated into the rural landscape without harm to amenity or environment. The officer's report is clear that the proposal is acceptable. We would welcome your support for the application. I'm happy to answer any questions members may have on the planning merits of the application and the applicant, Mr. Bowker, is happy to answer any technical or operational questions they may have. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Members? Uh, it's just with regard to, it was stated that the landowner had other sites available and this seemed to be the cheapest option, so you've, you've opted for that. Yeah, Going um, to the fact that, if it was Mr. Kincaid as stated, these are large agricultural buildings up uh, on the Watch Hill Road. Wouldn't it have been easier to tie it in with that? Because then it, it wouldn't have been as obtrusive because you've already got agricultural holdings there. The other one, this is a, a rearing or breeding unit. Are all your other units breeding units or do you take... Uh, but from this one to another development, therefore, would you not be better building it next to your rearing unit for the, the next stage on? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, obviously, I'm John Bowker, I'm the applicant. Um, you, you're correct that Mr. Kincaid uh, had a, an alternative site available to us, but upon investigation, we realised that it was quite low lying and susceptible to flooding, so it was ruled out at a very early stage. Um, with regards to the, you're correct, it's a rearing unit and we do move the birds to a, a lay site. Um, but we like to keep the, the rearing unit for biosecurity reasons separate to the lay site by a respectable distance. Um, this site was chosen for its location because it, it's easily accessible from, from Dumfries and both Lockerbie sites. So access was an was a important consideration for us. Any other members?
It, it's really with respect to um, policy NE13 on the agricultural soil issue. Um, I mean, our policies suggest that we really should not be building on prime agricultural land um, if there is another area available. And um, I, I'm curious to know why this has to be here and not on a, a, a land classification with a lesser um, use for agriculture. Um, as stated in the officer's report, not to repeat that, but basically the other areas under consideration were also constrained by either the regional scenic area or by flood um, issues. The area of land is within um, the better quality of soil. However, it is an agricultural use and the policy, um, as the officer's report states, specifically refers to the loss of agricultural use rather than um, any of it further. Any other members? Right. No other members. Thanks very, very much for the presentation. Members, we're now in session. Going to have pay. Tom. Thanks, Chairman. I think having heard uh, what we've heard so far today, I'm minded that we should do a site visit, but not just to the site in question, because it's not only the particular site that's uh, part of the, the objection, I would suggest, but there's things contained within the objection, such as smell and sound. That's mentioned in quite a number of the objections. And I believe the applicant has similar sites under his control. So I suggest if we're going to see the particular site, then to answer the other queries that objectors have about smell and sound, we should go and visit a similar site to see for ourselves. And I would so move. Members? Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Chair. I mean, there was mentioned earlier on about the, this one with Hunter's uh, name in it, and, and I think it was, somebody said it would be five times less the size of this particular one. It would be useful to see a comparison there. Um, I think I've, I've heard enough of representatives that there's this concern there about, you know, uh, making sure that we understand what the issues are locally as well, and therefore a site visit, I think, would clarify those, those issues. Jane? Um, I propose we do not go on a site visit. Yeah. Gillian. Um, thank you, Chair. Just to confirm, we have a, a motion um, by, by Councillor McCautry, seconded by Councillor Driver, for a site visit. We have um, Councillor Maitland has come forward to say she does not want a site visit. Is there a seconder to that? I'd say. Okay. So we have a motion for a site visit and an amendment for no site visit. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor Blake. Motion. Councillor Dick. Motion. Councillor Drybra. Motion. Councillor Ferguson. Motion. Councillor Geddes. Motion. Councillor Gilroy. Councillor Groom. Councillor Hislop. Motion. Councillor McGregor. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Amendment. Councillor McCautry. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Thompson. Motion. And Councillor Witt, please. Motion. Gillian. A decision has been made to undertake a site visit with 14 votes to two. Thank you. Alistair. Can we pick a good day this time, sir? <laughs> Drive our best, Alistair, after the last time. <laughs> Move on to item seven, use of land for site in a tent caravans and an amendment to road layout and stance positions to that approved under planning permission 08-P-1-2022. 
2-0160, retrospective at ba Bast Basterbrick, Ringford, Castle Douglas. Application reference number 13 stroke P stroke 2 stroke 0039. Dean's going through the slides. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to refer you to uh, the location planning agenda papers on page 49. Uh, what it shows is two sites immediately adjacent to each other. This, this proposal that's before you today is uh, the right-hand side site or the the northeasternmost site, being that this application relates to an area that was previously approved planning permission for the same number of uh, stances and road layout. Uh, the other application that's shown on that location plan is a second application that will come to this committee another time uh, that relates to that this proposal, but that being an area that wasn't previously uh, subject to a planning permission. So there's a site in context uh, in relating to uh, a raised area above Queen's Hill Estate. You can see uh, the woodland on the on the right hand side or eastern side of the of the site falls falls steeply into Queen's Hill Estate. You'll see that on other images. That's an aerial view, uh, site indicated in red. Those, given the nature of the application, those are the stances today in reality uh, as they're set out on site. At the moment, we have caravans on three of the sites, plots four, eight, and 12. And you'll see those as, as we go through the site, the site visit images. That's the layout as approved. Uh, under the 2008 planning permission, uh, what you'll see is that the, the amendment largely relates to the route of the road. Uh, I'll take you back to me so you can get a better impression. But essentially, what it, the current application is the, the sites, the three sites that are in the, if you like, the bottom of the image, they've, well, sites have been pushed further to the, the edge of the site edge and also further to the right. So if I just flick back, it's not quite the same orientation, but you've got, if you like, the, 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 the bottom right, there's, you can see those plots 12, 11, 9 and 8 are set out more, pushed more towards the edge of the, the plateau and also they've been pushed further into a northeastern direction. That's just another image showing the location of the septic tank that, that will relay and service both, both the current application and the subsequent application that will come before you. That's uh, just an approximation and it's based on uh, plot 20 uh, of how a caravan would sit on the site and where you'd, you could potentially get parking spaces allocated to each of the stances. Because it's retrospective, the, the proposed uh, bin collection area is already formed, be in there behind the dike and, and gate. That's the external lights that, that will be attached to each of the caravans under the canopy there. These are taken, these are images as supplied by the applicant. I just put, put them in and take you through it. This is a, a view towards the site. So what you've got in the in the middle there is the largely vegetated steep rise to the site. The site is over the top of there and pushes further north beyond the view. 
This is, uh, lo again, looking towards the site, you've got the, the high point there that's significantly vegetated. This is a view from the main road, the A road running northwards out of Ringford. I think. Yep, it's further north. This is down back towards Ringford, just on the edge of Ringford, looking in the same direction. On the horizon there is the plateau. And this is a more distant view from the A75, uh, just near the tea room. We're looking the, the central there on the horizon is the site. Caravans are in amongst that behind the vegetation. And this is a view from uh, the public right of way, a core path down near one of the properties, one of the nearer properties to Queen's Hill, looking up towards the ridge. You can see the trees there, actually rising up above the edge of the ridge. And this is a, a typical view within the site. You can just see in the bottom left there some of the, the surfacing for, for one of the stances. And what you can just about make out center horizon is the ridge of one of the caravans that's already in situ. This is an image I took. It's a bit dark, I'm afraid. It's from a high point to the northeast of the site, looking on a minor road that comes to a dead end at Barstow Brick. It's looking towards the site. I've done that to show the context of the ridge with the higher land behind. And those plots are actually pointing to caravans that are in existence now. Uh, you have to zoom in a whole lot to actually make them out. So this is one of the caravans. This is plot four. This is this is back in the site. It's away from the, the ridge edge. Uh, you can't make this site out from uh, any of the viewpoints down below in the valley. And what it shows is the gorse retention and what these done have sort of been keyholed into into openings in the into in the gorse. That's the same plot, just from another angle. See the, the gorse retention there. This is one of this is plot eight. Uh, this is one of the ones closer to the ridge edge. So the ridge edge is off off camera shot on the left, and you've got trees coming up the up the steep hillside towards the site. This is one of the undeveloped. Uh, well. It doesn't have a caravan on it, but the, the, the stance is formed. It's again, this is one on the ridge edge. We're on, uh, currently unoccupied, plot nine, looking back towards uh, plot eight, where you can see the caravan in situ. And off, off camera to the right is the fall of the, the steep slope to the east, down to Queen's Hill. This is the view from plot eight, which is occupied by a caravan, looking down towards Queen's Hill Estate got the intervening trees and this is plot nine looking back towards the Ringford direction again many trees there obscuring and screening the site from that direction and this is the other plot that relates to the, the nearest edge of the sites to the, the ridge edge And it's just to point out, it's looking back towards uh, the image I'd shown with where the arrows are pointing to the sites from an elevated position. The farms there on the, the horizon there, they relate to that minor road that where I gained the view from. And this is from plot 11, looking back uh, towards Thorn Farm. That's plot 12, one of the, the caravans are in situ. You see they're all of a similar format. That's the position of the septic tank with soak away. And that's the best elevated if a viewer could get within the site. Essentially, the site's a key hold into that gorse. That gorse is retained, supposed to be retained. Uh, all the sites are, are actually in place. Uh, it's recommended for approval subject to conditions. The conditions largely uh, uh, taken from the form of permission. I think the applicant might have something to say about the conditions that are proposed, but they largely relate to what's been just to just confirm it's it's there is a fallback position 
that what's been implemented so far, there is some cross relation to the 2008 planning permission. So there is a fallback position. The, the principle of the development is established. This assessment relates to the, the impacts of the repositioning of the road and some of the stances only. Nothing else to add at this moment. Members, point of clarification, feed in. Hi, thanks, Chair. What's the difference between a lodge and a caravan, please? Uh, I'm not sure there is a definition of a lodge. In 2008, when the application was taken, we described it as a lodge, but the plans that were included were actually indicating caravans, and they are caravans in reality. And so, I feel like if you, if you can retrospectively look back, what was approved were caravans. It's just in the description we put lodges where there isn't a planning description of a lodge. It doesn't have any legal meaning in planning terms, but the description was taken as offered by the applicant at that time. But they are caravans. If I can just I add that, that, sorry, Chair, if I could just clarify yeah. that, that there is a, a legal definition of what a caravan is in the 1960 Caravan Act. And that basically is something that could be transported in no more than two parts onto the site. So we had this discussion about uh, that with uh, Kipford application a couple of meetings ago, and it was the same issues sort of related to that. Patsy, I think that's what you've got to ask. <laughs> it was the same question, thanks. Tom, through you. <laughs> Ian. Um, just refer to the question I asked under the wrong application. Uh, 3.1G, the, the representatives have mentioned the, the private water supplies. Um, i just ask the case officer for a comment on um, the potential conflict with the requirements of the local plan general policy 55.8. Dean? Uh, that, that policy superseded. This application was, was submitted at a time when the Stewardship Local Plan was still material. Uh, obviously, today that's now been superseded. However, it doesn't mean that we don't have to take these kind of matters into account just because we've got a new LDP. However, this application is for an amendment to the plot layout and road layout. So what we have, we have a permission that the applicant can implement regardless for 10 stances at this site. So it's not something that's being explored largely because the fallback position is to site 10, 10 caravans or lodges at this site. Any other members? Jane? So to be absolutely clear, what we're doing is correcting an ir irregularity of, of compliance with the previous application. That's what we're doing here. Is that quite simple? David? That's it, yeah. In a word, yes. <laughs> No other members? Stephen, I mean. Thank you. Yeah, it's just uh, in the paragraph, sorry, on page 52, um, the Caravan Act 1960, thus it would appear original position was for lodges was in fact for the setting of caravans, and it goes on at the end uh, on good faith on that basis as being for permanent buildings. So um, although we're correcting something, I take it there's a built into that, there's an allowance that these are permanent buildings, even though they're not permanent residences, they're permanent buildings as opposed to caravans. A caravan, of course, can be a permanent building. It's just the definition of what actually gets on, on to the site. A static caravan is, to all means and purposes, you and I would look at it and say it's a permanent building. And indeed, that's pretty much what was approved with the lodge. Uh, members? No. Is good? We've got no objectors wishing to speak. We've got the, could we have the applicant, Robin Austin, please? Robin, you have three minutes and I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, nearly seven years have passed since we were granted the planning consent for this tourism development at Bristol Ridge. For all the right reasons of economic activity, employment and diversification of the rural economy. The site, as you've seen, was a rocky, undulating hillside almost completely covered in gorse bushes. Consequently, it was agreed that it was impossible to ascertain the exact 
application of lodge sites and service roads. So a condition requiring council approval of the final layout was attached to the planning consent. During the summer of 2008, we created the stances and the road network servicing them. On 29th October 2008, our planning officer, Mr. Ronnie Irvin, revisited the site and approved our work in a letter of the same date, stating that he could now confirm that the positions and levels of the lodges, as laid out on site, are acceptable and meet the terms of Condition 4 of our planning permission. From this, I concluded that I now had a completely valid planning consent and could legitimately, on the basis of that consent, start to sell lodges and lease out ground to third parties. Thereafter, the paperwork for the development was archived by the planning officer and remained archived before, for several years until our main objector, Mrs Shearer, started to object to the development, which eventually led to a Section 272 notice being served on us for the reason that we had not complied with the conditions of our consent and therefore our planning permission was invalid. I have since received written confirmation from David Sutty that planner Robert Duncan did not know of the existence of Mr Irvin's letter before deciding our consent was invalid and instigating enforcement action. In making the case for breach of conditions, Mr Duncan now states that Mr Irvin's letter does not cover the road network and does not provide a record of what was approved on Mr Irvin's site visit. In fact, Mr Irvin's letter is very specific in approving the levels and positions of lodges as laid out on site. In other words, Mr Irvin approved what was actually on the ground. The road network services the lodge sites and if Mr Irvin had found fault with the roads, he would have covered it in his letter. The fact that the paperwork was archived for several years indicates that the planning authority believed that the planning consent was complete. In the meantime, we have concluded legal contracts for the sale of lodges and 30-year leases for the for 30 sites seconds, to, Robin. To, to three separate parties based on the wording of our original consent. Ladies and gentlemen, my integrity has been wrongly questioned in this matter and I ask you to reaffirm, reaffirm the validity of the original consent or mirror the conditions of the the, the original in a new consent. This means that uh, condition one uh, should have and they shall be used for holiday use only should be removed uh, and condition three should be removed completely uh, on the basis that... Um, you wind up, Robin. That's fine. I can cover it in a question. Thank you. Members? Well, I'd better ask the question about what was just about to come. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the um, condition three, uh, if you look at your conditions, uh, it basically is asking for each lodge that goes on to site to be individually agreed, the positioning to be agreed with the council. Uh, basically, you can move uh, a lodge on the site, maybe two metres this way or that way, and the orientation can't be changed because the, the, the width of the site won't accommodate the length of a, of a caravan or lodge. So therefore, uh, you're talking about on a, a Whinny hillside something that is completely irrelevant. So I'm asking that that one's completely re removed. And on condition one, uh, if you look at the, it, the original uh, consent was the first part and did not have and they shall be used for holiday use only. Now, my issue with that is that I've already uh, got contracts with three people based on the original consent. And I think that I really haven't done anything wrong in this case and that you should revert to the words, wording of the original consent. Thank you. Yeah. Any other members? Ivor? Just with regard to uh, condition three, where you're saying that you'd like that removed, um, I'm not sure, maybe the officers will answer it later, but would you plan to maintain the same style of lodge on the actual site? You won't, we won't have a, a green one, a pink one, and a no, yellow no, one? No, no, we're, we're very much, it's a, it's a, a, a natural site. Uh, the, the, we want timber lodges. Uh, we don't, we're having all of the, the, uh, the boarding on the lodges all running horizontally. Uh, the new style is vertically, but we want to keep them all the same. We want to keep them fitting into the, the landscaping uh, on, a, on the side of a Whinny hillside, uh, something that's natural fits in well, and that's what we would like to maintain. Yeah. Member, other questions? Thank you, Robin.
Oh, Jane. Um, would uh, I, I'd like to ask about the lighting? Um, it's, it's something which uh, I, I I see that there is a condition here about lighting, um, and I wonder um, whether you would be willing voluntarily to to adhere to dark sky park guidance because I think that's what the um, local plan actually is sort of aiming towards. So um, it's just a question um, because I do know that if you are looking at external lighting might appear to be absolutely fine, but if you're looking up at a, a, um, at a, 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 an application site and there's external lighting, really because modern external lighting is really very strong, really quite surprisingly strong, particularly if it's LED based, which um, a lot of it is now. Um, and um, I, I think we should be extremely careful because this is wanting to look natural and I recognize what you're saying there. So. Um, I'm really asking for um, whether or not you'd be willing to, to look at that. Um, can I say, um, Councillor Maitland, that the, the, as you see in the picture up here, the, uh, the lighting on the outside of the lodge is, is under the overhang and so therefore protected from going up into the sky. And I understand from uh, Mr. Clatworthy that the this clause that is a condition that has been put in here is more with regards to site lighting and the, we have no intention of having site lighting and the, but I can, I can understand the requirement that if, uh, if, if I wasn't in charge of this site then maybe a, a subsequent uh, owner uh, may wish site lighting so therefore they would then have to revert to the council so I'm quite happy with that condition. I think we're point eight covers it as well. Yeah. Another member? Thank you. Thank you. Members, we're now in session. Yeah. Sorry, Chair, it's something I should maybe have picked up earlier on, but under a 4.14 other matters, on the one hand, we seem to be saying that we can put a condition on that it's a limit, limited uh, residence per, per year, but down the bottom, however, the planning authority cannot control tenure or prevent the possibility of caravans being either offered as second homes in private ownership or retained by a management company. So is, it, is that saying that we can't put on a condition now that they can't be used as permanent homes? Uh, no, what I'm trying to express is the fact that it's... The, the condition suggested is, is that it can't be used for permanent main homes, but it's, it's the tenure of the type of holiday use that I'm referring to that we can't, as a planning authority, say that they should be under control by a single management company and let out on one or two week basis to holiday makers, or they're owned privately and occupied as a second holiday home by a private individual. That, that's not, the, the, in both cases, they're not principal homes and therefore they meet the council's policy on holiday accommodation but we can't be specific about how the holiday accommodation is managed in that sort of micro level as long as they're not principal homes. David. Thanks Jeff. Hey, so what you're saying is they could be the owners and they maybe come up for a month or so. You can't get restricted to two or three weeks maximum. Yes. And also in this case, there is obviously, because it's an amendment to the positions, the condition, aside from the amendment that the applicant suggested, relates directly to the former condition, which can be implemented. You know, the fallback position for the applicant is to revert back to the original permission and have the same occupancy condition that was applied to the original permission. So what the applicants asked for in this case is the same occupancy condition to be applied. And, and so, if you like, removing the, the element that says and shall be used for all the purposes only. Thanks, Chair. Any other member? Aye. Chair, does that mean to say on that condition, say I was to get a job at Verstobrick for a, a month um, and I decide to stay there while that's happened, does that mean I can't do that as part, you know, if I own one of those chalets, I can't go and stay there for a month? 
or is it just you know because it's specific to holiday let rather than short time let? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to follow the argument. Um, well, well, if I was <laughs> if I was coming for six months to work in Dumfries and Galloway, could I stay in one of these lodges, or have I to be coming on a holiday to Dumfries and Galloway because it's open shall be for use as holiday use only? Yeah, I mean the the, the purpose of the condition is really to try and what what was sought was the it was referred to as a holiday development and it was assessed on those policies it wasn't assessed as a housing development in open countryside so it's really to try and prevent it from being used for that purpose i think what mr austin is trying to get at is that the exact wording we've got here may cause him some difficulties and that's what I understand he's requesting that that last sentence be looked at for that very reason. What we, I mean, we have no issue with it being owned as a, a second home, if you like. It's really to have, it shouldn't be a sole or main residence. That's the critical bit of it. Patsy? Yeah, I have two questions. It's uh, in, in 1.4. Uh, in the middle of that paragraph, it says, likewise, the caravan stances would appear to be mostly in different positions to the previously approved lodge positions, notably being positioned closer to the eastern boundary of the approved of, of the plateau above the steep slope down to Queen's Hill. What I'm really asking um, officers is that presumably the original application, it, it came in and there was no objections and it was done under delegated power and it was the sighting of these lodges or caravans, whatever you want, was slightly down and not quite so prominent. And the new application is making them more prominent. And I'm just wondering if they had been in the position that they were being proposed now, do you think they would have got planning permission in 2008? Because I think that's the, the nub of the thing, is that they're moving the position of the original planning application and whether that's appropriate or not. And the other thing I would like clarity on is 1.7, which is this letter, and whether it's how important it is or whether it's not important or whether there's no details on file or what the implications are with that letter. Dean? Uh, the first point, the recommendation from myself would have been exactly the same, because if it hadn't been, then I should be recommending refusal today. So, no. Uh, Maybe David wants to answer the, 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 the other point about the letter from Ronnie Irvin and confirming the, the acceptability of the, what he found on site. David? It certainly is correct that uh, when, well, for those who don't know, Ronnie Irvin was the area planning manager for the Stewartry area. He retired, I think, about 2008. Uh, Robert Duncan took over in that position. I think it is fair to say that uh, Robert wasn't aware of the existence of that letter when actions were instigated, but nonetheless, there are such significant changes to what was originally granted to justify the requirement of the application that's before you today, and I don't really have any hesitation about saying that. The, the letter that um, went out, unfortunately, does not have any plan that goes with it. It doesn't cross-reference a plan. so. What you see on the screen there is the reality, and that was the scheme that was approved. So we have no method of actually going back and establishing if what came in really reflected that or not. But all we could go on is the fact that what's there is not that, and therefore an application was required, and that's what's before you today. Archie? Can I just get a point of clarification? So we mentioned here on condition one, um, if, if that condition was the same as the previous condition for 2008 application, you wouldn't have a problem with that, David or, or, or Dean? It would be okay that way? Is that, is that correct? In, 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 that, in that case in here, I, I would suggest that we approve the, 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 the application subject to the, the conditions of replacing condition one on this with the same condition on, on, on 2008 application and go forward that way. Dean. 
Uh, can I just clarify also what the, the applicants also requested of committees that condition, just to run through it exactly, condition one is suggested in this report states that none of the caravans hereby granted planning permission shall be occupied as the sole or main residence of the occupant and they shall not be used for and they shall be used for holiday purpose use only the original permission from 2008 ended at the word occupant what what i did here was i i, I took a, a the standard condition we apply today on new sites and tried to move it towards the former condition but i left in the word in and they shall be used for holiday purposes only this Leaving that in makes no difference in planning terms. So that's what the applicants asked us. It makes no difference if we ended it at occupant and took out that word, and it makes no difference to the way they can be occupied. So the applicants asked us to remove those words. So that, that, that was a clarification that we're actually seeking, you yeah. know, which, which before, when, before I made the, the, the recommendation, you know, I was seeking that type of clarification. Therefore, looking at the recommendation in, in, in condition one, could we, um, de, as you suggest there, take out that last sentence? Yes. Could, could I, sorry, could I just clarify something else? The applicants also asked if the committee are prepared to remove suggested condition three. Uh, Members? Gillian? Just to um, kind of bring it together, Chair, we have a, um, a motion, which I don't think we have a sec. A sec oh, Tom. We have a motion then for the application to be um, approved as uh, detailed in the report, apart from a change to condition number one with the removal of and they shall be used for holiday use only. Um, and the condition one would finish after the word occupant. Members agreed? His item 8 has been withdrawn. We're now in item 9. 45 English Street Dumfries. Alterations to the shop front at 47 English Street Dumfries. Reference numbers 14 P 3 0424 and B 14-P-3-0469. We've got no members speaking of this. No. <laughs> Good. David Cartmill, let's go through the drawings in this one. Chair, before we start, could I just draw your attention to the planning numbers are not the same as what's in front of us. 469s has changed. Uh, sorry, I think the, the slide is wrong there. That says 459, it should be 469. My apologies. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Right, David. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the, the application is before the committee uh, as an objection has been received from Lowburn Community Council. Uh, the application is for planning permission and listed building consent for a replacement shop front uh, on, on the side, uh, sorry, on, on the north side of English Street near the junction with Lowburn Street. English Street is a, uh, an important route from the town centre uh, linking with the council headquarters and the railway station. This uh, is the state of the property at present. Uh, it's been empty for a uh, considerable amount of time and it's obviously a blight on the, on the street. But behind the boarding is um, a shop front uh, windows which are framed in a white UPVC and the door is also it's part glazed, but it's also framed in white uh, PVC. It's proposed to replace both uh, the 
shop windows with toughened glass set in hardened um, molded frames and uh, a part glazed uh, Georgian style hardwood door uh, with an opening fanlight above is also proposed. The uh, pilasters either side of the uh, shop front are to be uh, replaced to match the existing. And this uh, is uh, a shop on the corner uh, of um, English Street and Lowen Street um, and is virtually identical uh, to the appearance of the proposed um, uh, amended shop front. Recommendation is to grant uh, subject to condition. <laughs> members, uh, members, any points of clarification for David? Jane. Yes, I've lost the actual wording of it. What are these stalls, something or others? Um, is it just the uh, the sandstones being eroded? Is that what's happened behind the boarding? No, well, well, the, no, no. the stall risers are. Stall risers, uh, yeah. If you can actually just you can see it in the gloom, but you've got the windows are the um, the rectangular frames, and the bit of sandstone beneath that is the stall riser. So it's that that's just become eroded. Any other members? There's no. Alistair. Thanks. I wanted to ask the officer the mechanism for the canopy. Will that be removed under these proposals? Uh, yes, uh, that, that is not being replaced. It will be removed. So it will be a plain fascia. Uh, once it's complete. If no other questions, members, we're now in session. Archie. Approved subject to the conditions, Chair. Agreed. Just to confirm, the application has been approved subject to the conditions detailed in the report. Thank you. Right, we're now on item 10, erection of an extension to a pavilion including kitchen, cafeteria area, at Agnew Park Pavilion, Agnew Crescent, Stranraer, reference number 14-P-1-0633. I've got Billy Murray going to take us through there. Yes, thank you, Chair. As you say, this is an application for planning permission for an extension to the pavilion in Agnew Park. Take you through a number of slides. This is an overview of Agnew Park showing the application site. Uh, the existing building is the square building within the circle, uh, obviously the marine lake in blue. This is a view towards the existing building on the approach within the park from the southeast. Uh, existing building in blue, marine lake to the left in that view. Uh, the application site fronts the existing building closer view from the same kind of direction. Uh, the proposed new building would be on the level paved area fronting that building towards uh, the photographer. That's just a straight on view of the existing building. Front side of the existing building from the east. And this is the existing building from the northwest on the seaward side and that just to show the proximity of the building to the sea. This is just to the left of the, the pathway and lighting there, that's the beach at the head of Loch Ryan. Uh, this is the existing building from the other side, from the west. Proposed new building would be on the right in that view. Uh, this is just a view of the lifeboat station and boat house that's mentioned in the report. It was built round about the same time as the existing pavilion building when the park was redeveloped in the 1990s. And this is the view from the same location as I was when I took that previous photograph, looking over the marine lake uh, towards the existing building. The uh, proposed new building would be to the right of the existing building in that view. And just the final two views, sorry, final two views from Agnew Crescent over the park towards the building. Uh, again, the proposed new building would be in the foreground in that view. So it would effectively mask that view of the existing building. 
Uh, this is a view uh, from further round Agnew Crescent over the Marine Lake towards the existing building and the application site. Uh, existing site and floor plan for the existing building. Uh, proposed site plan showing the, the proposed uh, extension uh, forward of the existing building. And you'll note it's rotated through, I think I say about 40, 45 degrees in the report, so that it's, it's angle on to the existing building. That's a closer view. That's the floor plan uh, at ground floor level. Uh, at ground floor, there's a kitchen and servery and a cafe area. Uh, you'll see an enclosed stairwell, right hand corner there, that provides access uh, to the accommodation on the upper floor which consists only of the cafe carry, as it's identified there, uh, with six tables indicated in that area. So there's no direct connection between that cafe carry and the kitchen survey or the cafe downstairs. It all has to be via that enclosed staircase in the stairwell. These are the proposed elevations. So, the recommendation is to approve subject to conditions. Members, point of clar clarification for Bill, uh, Billy. David? Are you happy that that's attractive enough? With all due respect, looking at the Argon new building, it's not the most appealing to the eye. And I don't know that what you're putting in front of is necessarily enhancing the appearance, if you like. The recommendation is to approve. Uh, I, th <laughs> I think, uh, sorry, I was going to go on to say that I, I do mention in the report that it was uh, finally balanced in this, on this occasion. Jane? I, I was just wondering whether we could actually, we, we skipped through very quickly through the, the picture of what it was going to look like at the very end there. Got that. Questions for Billy? Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, this is a building that houses a uh, uh, third sector organisation, am I right? Uh, cares for people with, with severe learning disability. How would it impact on, that, uh, on their operation, given their current tenants in the other half of that building? I don't have the specifics of the proposed occupation of this this proposed building, as I understand it, is for public use. I do know that the existing building has been used in the past in association with the, the, the college uh, in Stranraer. The exact characteristics of that use uh, I'm not aware of, uh, and nor are they uh, a material issue in terms of this planning application. Uh, I think what I'm trying to get at, Chair, um, to you, Billy, is that it's a separate entrance in could you kind of show us on there exactly the different part? If you just highlight out the different part, the, the, the extension, the, the, the current part, and then the existing part, and where the different entrances are. I think that, that's my point. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that's probably the best view to explain that. Um, there are a number of entrances, actual facts. If we take the, the proposed building first, which is in the bottom of the photograph, uh, extreme bottom center. Um, there are two entrances there. Uh, go to the right, there's another entrance to the stairwell and via that stairwell into the cafeteria. Rear entrance to the cafe only. And then on the glazed link between the, the proposed new building and the existing building, there are two sets of double doors which would provide access to both buildings, to both the proposed building and the existing building. And then, of course, there are Another set of doors on the seaward side of the existing building, which would provide access from there. And as you'll note, on the side, there are actually two external accesses to toilets uh, and external doors to storage areas on the left. So there are quite a large number of methods by which both properties could be accessed because they are uh, clearly linked. Okay, th mm -hmm. thanks, Chair. Through you, that, that uh, gives me comfort, Billy, that the, the architects actually take into account the, uh, the, the current use and 
enhances the use, I would suggest, to the other people. Yeah, thank you. Jane? I don't think it's specifically a planning issue, but I'm, I'm curious that there isn't any disabled access or requirement for disabled access. Is that up to anyone else to think about? No way. That would clearly be a matter for building control, but it's a, a level site with no, there won't be a high upstand on any step, so I think it would be easy to make it comply. There may be no need for ramps or whatever, it will comply in terms of DBA. Members, no more questions, we're now in session. Oh, sorry. Right. We're now in session. Ian. Uh, I'd um, move, move approval uh, and uh, commend the case officer for his finely balanced decision regarding the uh, appearance of the building because what <laughs> this in fact does is actually mask what is not a particularly attractive building at, uh, currently and uh, very pleased to move it. Members agree? Agreed. Just to confirm. Jillian, yeah. members can... The application has been approved, subject to the conditions detailed in the report. Thank you. Item 11 is for noting only. Members noted. We have no other business. Thank everyone for attending the meeting this morning. Ellis, one of you.